Hello ladies and gentlemen, I'm Matt from Matt's Bookshelf and today I have a very special video in which me and my friend and fellow booktuber Big Nate, Big Nate's Book Review, discuss Blood and Radiant by Cormac McCarthy. If you couldn't tell from the title of the video, I've never read Cormac McCarthy before and Big Nate has read several of his novels so we thought it'd be an interesting discussion between, us, between the two of us on this book. I'll put Big Nate's channel in the description below as well as the podcast that he hosts called Big Nate's Short Story Clubs in which I am featured on a couple of episodes. And yes, this is a very fairly new type of video for me on this channel. So I'm interested in, so I am interested in hearing your feedback on anything about the production or the layout or just anything about the video at all because this is all totally new for me doing a book club. I think in the future I will do announcement videos on what books I'm going to read for a potential book club, so in case you want to read along, you can do so, but this is just kind of an experiment, uh, you know, see how it goes. So yes, thank you, and I hope that you enjoyed the video. It doesn't ask me gallery view or anything, but I'm pretty sure when I record to the cloud, it does gallery view. Okay, it was not the end of the world if it's not. That's true. Um, I mean, I'm working in gallery right now, so it should be okay. Okay, I think we should be good. Yeah. So I'm here with Big Nate for Big Nate's book reviews, home of the Good. best book reviews. You should know him from it. his, you should know from his world famous short story club, exactly, uh, which is on Spotify, which I'm on a couple episodes of. Yep. But today we are doing a full novel, that being Clark McCarthy's The Blood Meridian. And what makes, yep, I got mine right here. And what makes this discussion so important is that I've never read any Clark McCarthy, and. Big Nate is an expert on Cormac McCarthy. Yeah. And this is his second time reading Blood Meridian and my first time reading Blood Meridian. So do you mind going into a little bit of your history with Cormac McCarthy in this book? Yeah. Um, so I started with Cormac. Actually, I think this was the first Cormac McCarthy book I read, which was, I actually specifically remember I was in like this, uh, like liter some class related to literature in um, like this community college. And this dude next to me who I thought was like real smart, literally was like Blood Meridian is the best book. So I'm like, let me see what's up. And I did it. And then I was I was pretty hooked. It was it was a, I will say it was and maybe we can talk about this, but it was a bit of a more of a struggle the first time than the second time around. But I also read it a long time ago at this point. And even when I read even all that considered, it was like it at, it immediately placed itself as one of like the best books I, I had ever read. Not, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm standing by that. But so that was my first introduction, which I'm not sure I would recommend for most so you're of us. On, on your first reading, it was, you considered to be one of the best books you've ever read. Yeah, one, on my first okay. reading. Yep, yep. And that was a while ago, too, when Loki, I probably didn't even understand a good, like, quarter of it. No, that's not, that's not quite true. But yeah, I was, I was, and this, maybe we can talk about this, too. But this type of writing style is basically, this is my cup of tea, so to speak. But then I just kind of went down the line uh, and I read, like, The Road all the pretty horses um a short story here or there he has some fucked up short stories too um there's this one called a drowning incident which i won't i won't give anything away actually but it's it's very much related to a certain event that happens in this book but um let's see what else no country for old men i basically just consumed like cormac mccarthy and i'm still i, I wouldn't say i'm an expert i'm not quite a seasoned veteran because there's still a lot of his big ones i haven't read but i've read a good chunk the road too i forget if i said that that was a good one but um yeah this this is squarely his his my favorite of all of his books okay um i'm glad that we we did faulkner before because mm. i think i think Cormac mccarthy gets compared to hemingway a lot and but i got a i got a, a way bigger faulkner um inspiration yeah from... i don't see him i i could i do see parallels but hemingway is like you know short sparse sentences <laughs> And, you know, as particularly with the dialogue, Cormac McCarthy very much is like that, but he's very much not Hemingway, like in the fact yeah. that he's got these enormous run on sentences and like lots of, I don't know, with some of his descriptions, it is a little more not not certainly not like flowery, but, you know, a little more like eloquent than I would say Hemingway goes for. But yeah, very Faulknerian very Faulknerian meant I think at some point I mentioned it's like blood meridian is almost like southern gothic it's like not quite like that but it's like southwest <laughs> gothic and I think that you know that's obviously very much in keeping with uh Faulkner but yeah yeah so I should clarify because I, I did was a bad host and I didn't put this in the start this is the non-spoiler section mm, um yep. so for this section I just want to go over like what do you think Cormac McCarthy's like greatest strength is as a writer in blood meridian and then 
conversely, what do you think is his greatest weakness of this book? Um, okay. <laughs> greatest strength. I'll just, I can answer both of them with one okay. thing, which is, <laughs> which is his writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, I mean, strength, just because I don't know, personally, like I said, and this very much is Cormac McCarthy is very much like my cup of tea, but there, there are some, and like, to me, it's just, it's like straight up undeniable. There are so, so much of this book, the writing is just like, literally like astounding. It's straight up brilliant. Yeah. And just from everything, I mean, like the dialogue, like the descriptions of the setting, the characters, every element that there is to a story, I think he does phenomenally. Basic, like that's really like, like his strengths is basically just like, I think he's an excellent storyteller. But, and like, not to mention, I think he has very deep like insights on like human nature. You know, we'll get into all that. But, you know, this book, I actually view it almost like almost like a work of like fictional philosophy, like kind of kind of in that vein of things, because there's a lot of just straight, almost like philosophical monologues that that are in this. So I love all that. And that's my shit. But his weakness, again, is sometimes his writing is just like it's it can be very tedious. You know what I mean? And it can get very abstract where he'll go on these long rambling sentences that sometimes have words that like I've never even, you know, heard of. And it's just and it gets very, you know, like I said, like it, it's philosophical, which is one of the which is when it's done right, I think is very good. But there are times where it's kind of just like, what are you, what are you even, you know, saying at this point? It's like stringing just together like the most like ancient cool sounding words he can think of kind of and but you know that's like I think there's a lot more of the good than the bad and you know sometimes like the novel it's like all right we get it they are they are roaming the desert we understand like let's let's go but but yeah that's that's basically in a nutshell how I feel I'm probably gonna mimic you actually I think his greatest strength is his descriptions as well like even though like it gets monotonous at times there's always like he keeps finding new ways to explain the same thing basically yes, and it's very key. impressive but so it's a detriment and it's a pro because on one hand it's a guess we're getting the same descriptions kind of over and over again but at the same time he keeps finding new ways to to view them and stuff so I thought that was a really positive strength as someone who in my reading and writing really values character work I think this book has both great and terrible characters which we'll yeah. get more into in the spoilers like there's some some characters are so incredibly depth deep and others are like feel like they're written by like a like a, a middle school writer at times wait who so who do you think the bad characters are or is that is that spoiler so i'm gonna go more into it later on okay, but okay, i okay. think the kid the kid is the most frustrating character for me oh I'll, I'll interesting explain. Huh. i'll explain more later i didn't i did not see that coming okay yeah we will we'll, yeah, we'll talk about I'll, that i'll explain more later but um the kid was incredibly frustrating for me and then like, so I was it is, sorry, all, just real quick. It yeah. is, I, I did notice this, this kind of time around where it's like the kid is like allegedly ostensibly, he's like the protagonist. He's the person whose view we're taking throughout this whole thing. Like we are limited to what he is experiencing, but yeah, yeah in a way he does seem very like out of, out of reach. Like, oh, it's like, what is really going on with him? And I mean, I think there actually is a lot of subtle stuff McCarthy does that, that does get at like the, I would argue the depth of character in the kid, but I, I, I hear you, but anyway, proceed. And um, also like, I was looking at the, like the backstory in the publication of this book, it took him nine years to write. And at one point he like had basically given up on the books. He hated it. That's crazy. And, and then I read another quote saying that a lot of it, he kind of just wrote in one go, like he just sort of just wrote it out. And then I could see that. See well, so happened. sorry, real quick. Just, I got it. Now that you say that it's like, it, it does take on, stream of consciousness vibes which is very much what i like you know, which is very faulknerian and which is the part i don't like about this sometimes is it is it it's treads into faulkner territory it's like what are we even saying right now like it's just but too abstract even even apart from that like there are some sentences especially early on that aren't even like complete sentences mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> like, and then like there's like a scene where like where captain white this is early on it like sees like a horde of native americans on on the horizon it goes and it says oh my god it's a captain light and i'm like did that really make it to the final cut that's <laughs> like, funny i loved that part that's crazy that you say okay. that. i loved that part no that was amazing to me because it's like it's it's preceded by that enormous description of mm. you know well we'll get into all this but that apache charge and it's just like it's like ba- which is basically like one enormous sentence almost and it's like the most horrific thing and it was almost like comedic not even not quite comedic relief but it's just like that like blunt statement like oh my god just like the 
being so shocked at like what the because it's like it's obviously like contrasted like literally directly juxtaposed with like you know this oh my god line with like the most vicious brutal shit you have ever seen like the most horrendous heinous shit but i i i hear i'm hearing you i'm hearing you i mean but like just to say like that whole scene preceding the oh my god and then post oh my god as well like it's just like that's when i really clicked with with the novel i would say the first chapter or two i was like this is going to be difficult for me to read and then eventually the novel comes to its own or i just adapt it to the style but the first two chapters I thought were, were a little messy. No, but... I noticed I noticed that as well. Like there's like a the beginning is like it, he does that the the sentence not sentence thing, and it's just it's very ethereal. It's like what what is even taught? Like maybe we can even at some point like read the first lines. But it's just like it, 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 you're right. It's like not complete sentences, and it's just very it's it's very like w- what is hap- like what is actually happening right now. So yeah. and then it does, and I know there was at some point I even noted like a, a like it almost seemed like a shift in prose style where it just seemed to like be told like an actual story. <laughs> but, it became more some like yeah, it, it became more like sumptuous, less sparse and, and coherent. Areas. It became a coherent kind of narrative in like prose style. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. And so to close out the non spoiler section, do you recommend Blood Meridian to anyone or like who would you recommend this? No, book to? De- definitely not to anyone. First off, you got to have a little bit of um, you got to have a little bit of stomach to you because this book is uh, violent. I, I don't think it's I, we'll talk about it. I don't think it's gratuitously violent. I don't think it's violent for or maybe it is violent for. Well, put a pin in that. But it, it can it can. There are some descriptions here that are a little. Uh, that are and so that's actually something that um stuck at stood out to me this time too having read both the odyssey and the iliad but so the iliad is very there's a tons of parallels here where it's basically just these like insane displays of like violence and i, I don't want to say gore but you know how the iliad's talking about like viscera spilling and and like yeah, spears punching blood your flowing skulls. from his head and trail yeah and that's very <laughs> by the nipple <laughs> that exact that is all up in blood meridian like all up in blood meridian yeah. so yeah so that that's something and like the prose is difficult at the end of the day i think the prose is is it can be can be tricky but like i think if you're up to it then 100% recommend Blood Meridian, but I don't know. Probably, probably start with like. I would, I would say like. If it was, if it, if to ease your way into Cormac McCarthy, thin wedge to thick wedge, I would say like No Country for Old Men, All the Pretty Horses, The Road, Blood Meridian, and if you don't drop out at any point, if you can make it up to Blood Meridian, I think it will be your favorite of his books. Okay, I would. I mean, as someone who hasn't read any other Cormac McCarthy, I, I didn't think that this book was was like too challenging um whereas I think like if I like for like James Joyce I've said this before like if you read Ulysses first out of all of James Joyce's works and it's like what are you doing like you need to, you need to build yourself up to it in my opinion but I feel like with this book even though like again the first two chapters were were jarring for me to get into it it just it eventually becomes a more normal story um at some point so you need you do need i feel like a little bit of like i, I don't know what else to say besides like attention span because what i mentioned yes. is like like it it for long stretches is just like but this is this is the odyssey by the way this epic voyage and like uh dawn rose with her red rosy fingertips how many versions of that do we have mccarthyized in this in this book where it's just like the sun rises in another day of just traveling just epic mm-hmm. traveling but you know sometimes it can get a little old i guess or monotonous which i i do think very much is kind of the point you know like because that's what they're doing is day after day after day yeah traveling the desert but but anyway that that is just something you need to be prepared for but otherwise yeah i would 100 percent recommend that shit H- have you read lonesome dove by any chance or have you i heard have not it? read lonesome dove it's it's on my list of things to read it's a, it's a great book i mean yeah anyway i won't even get into that but the parallels with lonesome dove and blood meridian are actually just straight up like uncanny to the point where i'm like blood meridian had to have been based off of lonesome dove i was i was certain of it like this this idea of like traveling through every possible like hellish climate and nature and the elements as like as like an antagonist in this voyage this travel across the country and the dialogue it literally like interactions with like native americans and it's like it's insane like they're so they're like in lonesome dove not to go off like too much right now but they're like a herd cattling they're like herding cattle from 
um, Texas to Montana. And it's like in Blood Meridian, they encounter like uh, herd cattlers. I'm, I don't even think that's the right word, but like they enc- something, something like that, yeah. like whatever was happening in Lonesome Dove, that group, they encounter them. Like they encounter a group of them. And I'm like, that's obviously a nod to uh, Lonesome Dove. And it's like, even towards the end, like, you know, there's like that weird stuff with the buffalo and the bones, like the pile of bones. Yeah. In Lonesome Dove, there are characters at the, at the towards the end who like have bones, like they're doing the same thing with the same um, premise where it's like they're hunting buffalo and shit and collecting bones. So I'm like, okay, this is, it's it, it's almost like, like, I was like, this is clearly, clearly, based off of not based off of but influenced by lonesome dove or vice versa but Mm. amazingly they were both published in the same year 1985 so they could not have had anything to do with each other but it is just insane like if you read lonesome dove and you've read blood meridian you will know exactly what i'm talking about is is lonesome dove as violent as blood meridian it's no it's certainly not no there's definitely there's definitely divergences but i mean there are some actually brutal scenes in lonesome dove just some straight tragic shit But even just like the like the dialogue being just so on point and you go to town and you like raise hell and everything. That's that's all up in both of these. Maybe maybe someday in the future we'll do that. Yeah, I would totally. I've actually been wanting to reread Lonesome Dove. It's just Mm -hmm. it's just a fun book, too. Like it's it's like that mine is over like or it's like, yeah, it's over a thousand pages. But I but I read it like it's one of those books that like I will I will read that book faster than I'll read like a 350 page book kind of okay wow that's high praise yeah so we're firmly into the spoiler section now um I want to first talk about McCarthy's prose and his plotting but I I just want to read like a small excerpt of what you can expect from like from like a general setting description from McCarthy so this is on page 182 of my copy but we have the same copy actually but yeah yeah um so this is at some random point when they're traveling through the through the great west Uh, That night they camped at a warm spring atop a hill amid old traces of Spanish masonry and they stripped and descended like acolytes into the water while huge white leeches willowed away over the sands. When they rode out in the morning, it was still dark. Lightning stood in ragged chains far to the south, silent, the staccato mountains, bespoken blue and barren out of the void. Day broke upon a smoking reach of desert darkly clouded where the riders could could count five separate storms spaced upon the shore of the round earth. They were riding in pure sand and the horses labored so hugely that the men were obliged to dismount and lead them, toiling up steep eskers where the wind, I don't know if that word is eskers, where the wind blew the white uh, pumice from the crests of the spume from sea swells and the sand was scalped and frailly shaped and nothing else was there save random polished bones I like see, this is what you expect from, from the whole novel <laughs> i love that shit i love that scene particularly with the five separate storms just the absolute power of nature which is very much one of the nature almost takes on like a character form in this book in the way that it's just it's an anti like it is a force against which everyone in this book is battling with constantly and it takes lives like nature alone takes lives yeah and but yeah no that the chains of lightning the five separate storms around the globe it's very it's got very throughout the whole book it's 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 got like celestial almost like astronomical language and you mentioned you said like they dipped into the river like acolytes like there's so much there's there's religious imagery everywhere like there's like how many times do they dip into like a fort like into the river and it's like a baptismal candidate or there's buzzards like like little black bishops and not to go off but it's like someone gets pierced an arrow and they fuck they're dead and they're slumping as if they're in prayer like everywhere that is all yeah. throughout the book mm-hmm. all throughout the book and yeah so like when you're reading that on one hand as we said like with plotting so we're going to talk about plotting descriptions i think they're they're both pretty linked like on one hand yeah it's there are moments where it's like wasting time where it's like we don't really necessarily need a description but at the same time if you're patient, I think, and you read the the description, it's like you can get something out of it. You can take something out of it. It's sort of like Hemingway's iceberg theory, which I think Hemingway used as a way to cover up some of his inadequacies as a writer. But like yeah, here, yeah. I think, <laughs> I think um, it, it works, even if it's not intended by the author. I think if he ha- like he's he's writing in that mindset of like semi-religious epicness of nature, cruelty of nature these mm-hmm. characters that are basically like the four horsemen of the apocalypse, just like reigning terror wherever they go. Yeah. Um, there's just a lot you can, you can get from these descriptions. Yeah. And the senior descriptions, it's like, yeah, they, they do 
kind of get old but then again it's like if you like just stop to pay attention to what the like what you're actually reading it's actually it, like in terms of descriptions of scenery it is oftentimes like beautiful straight up beautiful mm-hmm. this was if I, it's been a long time since I read this, but I kind of remember Grapes of Wrath being like this, where it was like there was a ton of descriptions of like the land and of nature. And it's like, it, and again, it kind of made the, it, it kind of made the book a little tedious. By the way, I'm like, I haven't read this in like a long time. But then, but it's like, if you stop and just like pay attention, it's actually sort of amazing. And, you know, and part of it, why I want to, where it's like, okay, get on with it, get on with it, is not because the writing is bad or anything, but it's because, like, I'm just so invested in the story and the characters that it's like, let me, like, they are just so good that it's like, get on with this scenery shit. But, but no, the scenery descriptions are phenomenal. Hellish, too. Hellish. And, is there, yeah. um, is there any, like, excerpt you have of description or anything that you want to read? Or, or I actually don't, like, I didn't really put too many down, just, but, but I think it's because, it's it's one of those things where it's literally just so present throughout the book it's it's hard to just single out any one actually the one i was thinking about doing was the one where you could see the the five different storms but i mean just like for one you get basically every kind of like hellish climate you can imagine most of it is just baking scorching desert heat right like there's the part where the kid spits and he's so dehydrated it's just foam and a lizard runs up drinks the foam and the 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 spot where it had been left is dried up in like a second the whole thing is just gone that's how that's how fucking hot it is and there's never enough water they're always in search of water always in search of food and you know that's a big thing i think is like you know like the desert landscape particularly because you know this book is very much takes place in like the southwest but i mean you get you get hail storms you get dust storms which again is crazy because it's like that is literally a fundamental part of lonesome dove like there are hail storms and there are dust storms mm. and though that is like literally verbatim in in this book and you know there's like lightning and shit that will catch trees on fire which there's another religious image there you know the part i'm talking about with he it's strike he sees a he sees basically what's effectively a burning bush in the middle of the desert because the lightning struck it and then he goes down to warm himself and then that's when all the other animals come around and they're all huddled together around like this burning bush. And then, you know, that's an enormous part of the book, too, is animals and the the reduction of humans down back to their animalistic state. Mm. And there's so many there's so many points where they're described as like like the, the company is described as like a band of apes. Like literally, and it's like all the people in the, like, there's a quote, they fight with fists, with feet, with bottles or knives, all races, all breeds, men whose speech sounds like the grunting of apes. And it's like, they're eating raw meat and they're drinking along. So like they, you, they pull up to a water hole, the animals and the humans alike are drinking side by side. And it's like, there's so much of that all. And it's, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself at this point, but it's like, you know, Glanton and his weird connection with animals, like this almost spiritual connection he has with his, with his horses and, and his, and even the dog. It's like when you, the setting in the land is such that it's like humans are basically reduced down to their primal state. And even just on that note, it's like, there's a part, where they're described like th- this part I thought was actually kind of funny too, where it's like the arrival of them going to the town suggested not even so much as the discovery of the wheel. Like they are in their most primitive forms all throughout the book, dirty, muddy, disgusting shit like that. But anyway, which I think is hand in hand with like the nature thing with the fact that like they are in, they are roaming this, this desert fucking wasteland. It's like, so of course it, it's, it's a desert wasteland. It's terrible. But at the same time, sometimes you wake up and the birds are twittering and like there's, there's a beautiful description of a sunset. And there's like that part where at some point they're walking through the forest and even Glanton, he, he gets that leaf. He picks up that leaf and he, he tw- he's twirling it in his fingers. And he says, um, and the perfection of that loss, the leaf was not even lost on him. Like something like that. Or even just like when they're in California, after it's it's just um um and it's not toad vine what's 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 the priest's name oh tobin tobin yeah tobin and when ex priest ex priest the ex priest tobin and the, ex-priest, the, ex-priest, and the yep. kid and it's like they're like finally in an area where there's woods and it feels so refreshing the imagery versus just like um like the barren wasteland at one point it's it's incredibly hot the next point later on it's like it's like a winter like 
like tundra basically and it's like when they're mm-hmm. finally in like just normal nature it's like so refreshing um yeah it's and then that, that just is more strength of mccarthy's prose and his ability to plot out um the story yeah but th- so but th- but then i think again the beauty of mccarthy and i think this is a again a theme because because i think the same principle of like these little hints of beauty i think that is all throughout blood meridian and we can talk about that but like little it's like in a weird way, everybody kind of has, well, okay, certainly not everybody, but a lot of people has some weird, like not redempt, not even redemptive quality, but they do so some forms of conscience, particularly the kid and even like people and like toad vine and, and even, even Glanton and people have like their, their like, again, not to get ahead of myself, but you know, Glanton at some point, remember he sticks up for um, <laughs> there's white Jackson and black Jackson and these yeah. like, and they were saying black, like black Jackson needs to go sit in the colored area. And Glenn's like, no, he's, he's yeah. eating with us. We're, that's not going to happen. So anyway, just weird little hints of like, yeah, conscience all throughout this thing, but then contrasted once again with, cause like in that scene with the forest and the beautiful leaf, him twirling the leaf, like 10 seconds later, a bear jumps out of nowhere and <laughs> mauls the Delaware until, until his legs, he's, his legs are dangling from his jaws, which yeah. I have to say. That is literally a scene in Lonesome Dove too, where a, a bear pops out of fucking the woods, mm. and I forget if it takes names, but it's like and then they shoot the bear too. And they just and then they, and then they never find the body, so it's yeah, like exactly. who even knows? Like again, is it more religious things going on here, yeah. or oh yeah, the supernatural supernatural elements aspects. to this are. I mean, we'll get to all that with with the judge, and I mean, okay, just to just to while we're on the topic of like animals the bats dude the bats are everywhere which of course are like a, a symbol for you know like of you know what i don't know what you would call it like evil or hell or something like that but it's like there are multiple points are there bats introduced so I'll, i'm actually just going to read a quick quote yeah so a wrinkled so he's describing the bat a wrinkled pig face small and vicious bare lips crimped in a horrible smile it crafted in his neck two narrow grooves and folding its wings over him it began to drink his blood and then just because this next part i think is a good description of like <laughs> just blood meridian honestly Sproul, because this guy just got basically his fucking blood sucked by a, a a bat because, you know, nature, that's just another thing. Nature imposes itself on the characters all, all throughout the book. And also it it eludes them, too, in, in the sense that it's like they're trying to hide from the Apaches or a gang of like Mex- some some rival gang, nowhere to hide, completely barren. And that it's like nature at that point is doing them almost like a, a disservice. It's it's outing them. But but anyway. So the dude gets get bit, got bit by the fucking bat. Sproul was clawing at his neck and he was gibbering hysterically. And when he saw the kid standing there looking down at him, he held out to him his bloodied hands as if in accusation and then clapped them to his ears and cried out what it seemed he himself would not hear, a howl of such outrage as to stitch a sejura in the pulse beat of the world. And it's like, God damn, bro. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. So getting to the characters of the story which are in many ways tied to the the landscape itself um yeah. the kid so the kid as we alluded to earlier i'm not a fan of the kid as a character that's it just, funny it stems from just like my hatred of first of all like one named protagonists that are just sort of in many ways like a camera they serve as like a camera to watch events yeah and it you. got to the point where i i thought the kid had died at one point and i missed it because oh, he that's... just just doesn't show up like he drops off yeah he he does drop off and to to, to your point i don't I, like now i'm thinking about it i feel like we don't get any look into the like interiority of the kid like what he's thinking about what he's feeling like we don't really get very much of any of that anything anything that's related to the kid is related is revealed through through dialogue or like external behavior of which there's not much and it's like there's so many opportunities for him to, to like react to his environment and all the brutality that he's witnessing and it is glazed over to a certain extent and it's like there, yeah, there are there are there are chances to show depth with him but mainly he's just like he's just like like the the, the generic protagonist who just does what the plot needs him to do and he doesn't really react to anything in any towards the end when he's the man he's um <laughs> i personally i love see i love that shit but yeah i i, I hear i hear you 
he's he he reacts more and he feels like he has more of a character and like the, the judge becomes more scary true. based on how he's like just like terrified of this man and like it like reflects in the audience as well but like it was like earlier on i was like did, did he like how does he feel about like watching glant and like smash a baby's head against rocks like like what is like is he react at all or anything and it's like at a certain to a certain extent like i don't mind them breaking away from him because i found the other characters more interesting but like there is so much there is such an opportunity to um to like make him better and to like and to like enhance the story but they just didn't go do it in my opinion they just like Cormac just made like the most bland like white bread protagonist okay i I hear you. I hear you. I would okay. I would disagree that the kid lacks depth. I think the kid okay. does does have depth. I agree completely that that might even be an official critique of mine. Is that I I, I think Cormac McCarthy probably could have done done more with him, especially considering he's like you know he is the because I I was thinking about this actually where it's like uh, I was thinking that like the kid is almost like he is the protagonist, but in in many ways he's actually not the protagonist like at all because we really he's almost the character we get the the least of interestingly it's like i was even thinking the judge is almost like the the main character of the story except that's but that's the, that's not quite right but he's like the antagonist though it doesn't yeah you can have yeah. your antagonist be like the main character yeah yeah and like we at least certainly know much more like put it this way i think if the kid had the depth that the judge did it would have it would have been better. I, I agree with you. He 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 could have done more. I think with with, with him. I, I'll 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 agree with you on there, but I do think he has more depth than you are giving him credit. Um, and maybe on a reread, I'll I'll I'll, I'll excavate more depth. But at least on a, on a first reading, it's like he disappears. Like how? No, you're have- you're totally right. You're totally right. I was even thinking about this too. It's it's, it's even more. I almost feel like it's more obvious on the second read how it's like because it starts very much with him. We are following him going from place to place. And it's very much like, you know, in the beginning with like him and Toad Vine, you know, it's it's the kid's story. And then towards like the, basically the entire middle of it, like the majority of the middle of it is just like, it, it's just zooming out and it's just, now it's the entire like gang. And if anything more so focusing on like the judge and arguably even something like glancing, but um, I, I agree with you there where he does debate he does drop off the map completely mm. totally I, I I agree first off let me just the beginning one of the beginning lines of uh the story is which this is a great example of the writing I don't like it says night of your birth 33 the Leonids they were called god how the stars did fall I looked for blackness holes in the heavens the dipper stove and it's like, all right, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't like that, but I do think it's interesting. So basically, the the night that this kid is born, there is this like massive meteor shower, and I looked this up. What's like, what's the Leonids? And apparently, it's like a Leonid is like the name for any of the meteors that take place like on this annual meteor shower, like on specifically like I think November fourteenth. So I didn't look too much into that, but it's like it is interesting how there's almost like this cosmic significance to the birth of the kid which maybe relates to his ultimate like crossing of paths with the judge although the judge appears to be everywhere omnipotent you might or not even uh omnipresent i think it is but anyway so that was you know a meteor shower on the night of his birth caught this cosmic significance and then i mean in turn we can talk about this later in terms of like the violent stuff but literally as a child it says already in him was was brooding a mindless a taste for mindless violence but but we we see later too it says because this is when he's the child it says the child's face is curiously untouched behind the scars the eyes oddly innocent and it's like that i think is a just a a little bit of foreshadowing because you you know what i mean when where the kid has like these redemptive not maybe not even redemptive but he does show these signs of complexity where he he like Okay, like for instance, you know, in the very beginning, there with the bar, you know, we're in the bar scene where he, he, he walks up. I mean, actually, there are several bar scenes. So let me, let, let me, let me. Is the first one you mean, like when he meets uh, Toad Vine? I think it was, yeah. Which, by the way, that was fat to me. That was a fascinating interaction where they're like basically kill each other or like try to kill each other, and then the next morning they wake up, and the kid, 
well first off toad vine which he has like this weird moral conscience too he says he says you're not he says something like you're not that bad there's he said he, he said there ain't nothing wrong with you something like that and then the kid hands him back his sword or his fucking not his sword his knife it's like they were literally like wrestling trying to fucking kill each other the night yeah. before and the next day oh now i'm thinking about it, the judge has a lot or maybe it's like narrator that has the line but blood is blood not the the temper that or is not the mortar that tempers like is blood is the bonding agent of mortar so it's in, it's like toad vine and the kid like fight literally trying to kill each other which okay just a, that's an initial thing about like a foreshadowing of the violence because someone's like literally like you better get out of my way and it becomes like a it becomes like yeah. a, like a knife fight rolling in the mud literally trying to fucking murder each other but and then the so the kid hands him back his knife, but that's actually not. It's a different bar scene, where, like, remember he he's like he goes in and he wants a drink and he says he doesn't have money. So I mean the kid is like this badass motherfucker in this lawless land. He could he could get a drink if he wants to, basically like through force. But he he offers to sweep the entire place. He said like he he has like this weird sense of fairness, which none of the other characters in the book would have done this. But he offers to sweep the entire bar. He sweeps the entire bar. And then the barman's like, nah, you're not getting a drink. And he and he has a pistol. He works his he's he basically takes the pistol from this from the bartender and he could shoot him right then and there. He disassembles the pistol so that he can fight fairly with with the bartender. And he's yeah. like, so like multiple points, he could have just like he could have opted for the more brutal alternative but he disassembles i mean so i say that and then um <laughs> then he like slaughters the whole village and you have no sense well yeah that he felt bad about it yeah that's okay you're right there they're, i i hear you on that because it's like the judge we have like a pretty good look at the kid it would have been interesting to see the kid's thoughts on that because you're right there's no reaction and then right after literally what i'm saying where he dissembles the pistol it says he backhanded the bottle across the barman's skull and crammed the jagged remnant into his eye as he went down so it's like I'm not saying the kid's good, but he does have, the, and it's like, there's the part where David Brown has that arrow in his leg and no one's helping him. He's like, someone, I'm going to fucking die if no one helps me get this arrow out. No one's doing it. And then he, he's the one to, yeah. even at the risk of his own life, cause Tobin gets pissed at him. Basically. He's like, don't you know, he would have, he would have killed, he would have, if he, if he died, he would have taken you with you like a bride to the altar, some shit like that. Mm. And then there's the, there's the scene too, where the guy, and so to your point, I wish there was more of this. I wish there was, there was more of this. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the, the Jesse Glanton, I guess, interchangeably, because oh, yeah. like, yeah. they're so related. Um, but they have some secret, a, some secret covenant. Remember, Tobin says they have some secret covenant. Yeah. They were talking with each other. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting conversation they have later on that we can read. But um, Glanton is based off of a real historical figure who like died when he dies in Blood Meridian, the book. Oh, and also true. the judge is based off of a semi-historical figure that um, no one oh, shit. knows about. So it's all from these memoirs of, of this former Union soldier who rode with Glanton's gang, which is real. And they were scalpers in real life um, going through Mexico and hunting down Native American tribes. And they did start off with the Apaches and then slowly moved on to you know innocent people. And yeah. Glanton does get killed by the... the um, we guys have a Y. What's you know what the tribe's name is? The y Yuka. Uh, I for oh, I think it was I, the Yumas. Was it the Yumas? Yumas, yes, Yumas. Yeah. Um, he so like he's a pretty interesting character. He, he starts is. off. I think is it one of his one of one of his first scenes. He's like just like he's just like shooting animals. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's, just it, like, it, like cats. It's like, like, just, like he's, standing he's buying. He's buying a gun. He's testing out a gun, and he's just like pop, 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 pop. Just like in the middle of town square, knocking shit. Like, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's. That's our first introduction to Glenn. And then he says, like, that ain't worth no 50 bucks. <laughs> Cause he's just, and it's like those, those scenes are crazy too. Cause it's like he shoots the chicken and the chicken is described. It's like just disappearing. Like it was the chicken yeah. was there. <laughs> yeah, and, then, and then it it's was it's comical. Not. Yeah. He yeah. also like he his his death scene is like very fitting for his yeah. for his character. Like, so like he 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 wakes up and he's just surrounded by by enemies and he just like swears them all to hell and then yeah, exactly gets murdered. And yeah, exactly. He's on the tail. He's on the receiving end of what he's done so many times. Yeah, no, exactly. Apparently, like, again, he he's finally it, it just it just t taps into like the hardships of this kind of living where it's like it's, it's almost like kind of like a mafia sort of thing where it's like mm. you're there. You're either doing the hits or you're going to get hit kind yeah. of thing. And it's like, yeah, it's like you you can live this this lifestyle 
for as long as possible, but eventually like your number is going to get called because yeah, like it's, and it's after um, he it's slaughters. Li- it's live, live by the gun, die by the gun, basically. Yeah. And especially because it's, it's like, cause like he, he kills the Yumas before earlier on and this is yeah. like their revenge in this terrible like just carnage and it's like yeah it, i feel like glanton's like a pretty i don't know maybe not perfect but he, he's a nice like little symbol for just like america early colonial america yeah because there's like the part where he is like so there's like the boat ferry and he he basically like takes that shit over and then and then raises the price on everybody and he like literally enslaves people to do the labor it's like yep yeah, that's like Cormac mccarthy i don't think shies away from painting americans in a very bad light particularly in these like early historical times no i don't i think he yeah he's very accurate and like very honest there's no there's no real patriotism in this book yeah like it's not it's not john wayne you know killing faceless native americans like it's like you it's almost like the, the iliad where it's like you get little descriptions mm. of people as well yes. like so like yeah. so like it, it it prevents you from thinking like from think, thinking the violence is heroic in any way yeah um so that stuff is really good yeah if anything, and, it's like the americans if anything are just portrayed as like stupid and rude and because you know it's like they're constantly referring to the apaches as savages and then completely paralleled with like the americans are the savages if anyone's savage impro- it's like american um, impeding on territory that's not theirs slaughtering yeah. innocents and it's like he even there was somebody who mentioned like it was I think it was like Bathcat who says something like when they first Bathcat's got there, an interesting I wish there was more Bathcat I'm sorry yeah 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 no you're you're right but he was like he was like when we first got here the Native Americans were nothing but great to us they they fed us they gave us shelter and at the end of the book Tobin and um, Tobin and the kid who are they saved by at the very end when they're getting chased by the judges Native Americans like yeah. that come and welcome them in and give them food and everything so if anything the people the 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 people who are portrayed in the worst light is like i said yeah exactly the americans who come into like land that's not theirs start just slaughtering motherfuckers to people to, to the same people who were you know welcoming of in some respects what like very considering they're coming on their native land and like they're giving them food and shelter and stuff like that it's like they are and then because at first it's like okay the because we're first introduced with like the apaches for instance in that crazy scene which we we wish we should talk about and it's like damn that's crazy but you realize they're just returning the fire that the americans brought in the first place because the americans are equally capable if not more so capable of the carnage that we're first introduced to what are are your thoughts on the judge and like has has your opinion on them changed at all in the reread um my opinion of the judge is that he I, I understand he's terrible, like truly evil, but he is one of my like favorite characters in fiction. I love the judge. He is just like, he's like, cause you know, he's weirdly like charismatic and he, and, and this, and you know, I was talking about the philosophy in the book. That is the judge is the philosophy. He's the one where that all, where that all comes from. And I just find him such an interesting and fascinating character. Like, is he, is he like human? Is he supernatural? Like, so he's described as this, so I'll just read this when they when he first comes upon the judge, he was bald as a stone and he had no trace of beard and he had no brows to his eyes nor lashes to them. He was close on to seven feet in height and he stood smoking a cigar, even in this nomadic house of God. And he seemed to have removed his hat only to chase the rain from it for now he put it on again. And then so, OK, that leads to like the first scene that we're introduced with him. But like he's this sorry, there's like a my uh, I delivery guys right here too anyway um but he's this ball he's like this literally hairless seven foot enormous dude who we'll learn is just he almost has like this like da vincian quality to him where he knows all about science in biology and um in geology as well he knows all these different languages he's well versed in latin and he's familiar with like major works of literature and he can dance and he can play the fiddle and he's ambidextrous like a spy two-handed as a spider like he's he's fascinating is what he is and um have you seen any fan art people have made of of him I haven't looked at it recently, but when I first looked at, uh, when I first looked up or read Blood and Meridian, I was, I, t- yep, verbatim, the judge fan art, Blood Meridian fan art. Um, do you remember like that scene, speaking of like his knowledge of biology and just everything, like when he's, when he's writing down the description of the creatures he meets in the desert, cause he, yes. wa- cause he's like, I'm not aware of this, that this thing is in my kingdom. Yeah. So yeah, there's that supernatural aspects of it 
And um, yeah. also when they first meet him too, like he is, they're on the run and from Apaches and they go to like this volcano and yes. he comes up with, and that's where they meet um, the judge. And he comes up with this idea that he needs to urinate on, on the soil to, to oh, okay, and, yeah. it serves, so, and it serves as bullets. Yeah. And that serves as another layer of like, I think Cormac's comments on um, like the American expansion at West. Cause it's like, they're literally like urinating oh. on like on native land. It's like, yeah. again, that's, yeah, th- there's, I've, I've heard people say that like people who don't like Lone Ridian say that um, Cormac's philosophy is in line with, with the judges. And like, I'm like, he's the antagonist. How can Cormac think this? Um, and so like, I think it seems like that where like, where again, like he's there, where they're just completely disrespecting the natives that shows like yeah the judge is clearly the villain and also with his character like and this is kind of because i mean you, we talk about the violence and and blundering this is sort of hand in hand with the judge it's like when they're around the judge they, they like they like ride through villages that they're slaughtering like like horsemen of the apocalypse where like they're untouched by everyone and they're slaughtering everyone else yep. so in a certain extent i didn't like how they would they would murder they just go through battle after battle and like not suffer any real casualties until like towards the end of like any like named character but like at the same time it kind of works in like a, a like a supernatural religious way where it's like it's almost like the judge is like giving them this immortality as long yeah. as they're murdering they're going to live forever and it's not he's until, like they're it, he's like their talisman almost yeah like and he's their... dies when he's away from the judge yeah true that is very true yeah yeah, no, exactly. No, that that scene with the Americans, I yeah, there's a there's a few things to talk about there because I think that's particularly where the supernatural quality of him, of him comes about too. So first, like they, when they first 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 meet him, um, it was the meridian of the day. First yeah. off, and then he's sitting upon a stone, like it's the only it's the only rock in the entire desert, and he's sitting there as if he was expect as if he was waiting for them. Mm. And then so and you mentioned like the, the thing with the piss. First off, it's him having this like like insane, almost like alchemy, alchemic knowledge of like yeah. the of the uh of the materials out there and what to combine to form gunpowder, which that by the way, that was literally I'm so glad I read Paradise Lost before this because that is that has to be a nod to what happens in Paradise Lost because he's talking about in or in Paradise Lost, it's like they remove from the earth like this nitrous quality and they mix it together and they use it for literally gunpowder for like a cannon so that they can just like start shooting at angels and then yeah the judge it's like literally described as nitrate nitrite something like that like nitrous materials that he stews in like yeah and it's that that whole scene where he's he he lines everybody up and he's been mixing everything he's pulling these materials from the earth and he's mixing into it and he's laughing and he's smiling. He says, piss, man, piss like your life depends on it. And he's just like kneading this fucking dough. It's, it's, it's surreal. Mm. And do you think, do you think um, the, the judge is like an immortal being or something? That's the question. That is the question. My so- only evidence that he isn't is that after they're, after the, the, the Yumas just like destroy their gang and they're out in the middle of the desert. And they have no shelter. Like the judge needs Toadvine's hat yes. to like prevent himself from getting sunburned. Yeah. So like I think that is probably the only illusion that he can actually feel pain is the fact that he needs to protect his his bald head from the sun. Like like the sun hurts him. Yeah. The blinding light of the sun hurts him. And so I mean, there's a few things that because you're right. That's the only time he shows any like physical weakness whatsoever. But I mean, there's a couple of things. Like there's the coin trick, which I thought was interesting yeah. and it's like and also just coming back to the relationship with the judge the judge and the bats he talks about how when they're going up in this like volcanic place it's like there is literally thousands of bats coming up from the cave and there's a part later where also the judge apparently just at night likes to just roam around naked and like sitting perching on ledges and shit and there's like one part where uh going back to like the vitruvian man like leonardo or when you saying something different yeah, yeah 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 and there's a part where it's like he, he so there's bats and the judge is just sitting there naked on a ledge yeah. and he lifts his hand and the bat and the bats flared in confusion and then he lowered it and sat as before and soon they were feeding again so it's like he raises his hands and these bats go ape shit there's some kind of almost like 
I don't know, like spiritual, like electrical echolocation quality to it. Like, I'm not quite sure what it is, but he, it's something to make these bats, which of course have this um, symbology related to like hell and evil and everything makes them go crazy. He puts it back down and they go right back to normal. So I just have one, one quote I want to read from the judge about like his ideas on war. I thought was really interesting. Um, this is the nature of war whose stake is at once the game and the authority and the justification. Seeing so, war is the truest form of divination. It is the testing mm-hmm. of one's will and the will of another within that larger will, which because it binds them is therefore forced to select. War is the ultimate game because war is at least, is at last a forcing of the unity of existence. War is God. War is God. That I mean, and then like earlier he too, he says, it makes no difference what men think of war. War endures. As well ask men what they think of stone. War was always here. Before man was, war waited for him. The ultimate trade awaiting its ultimate practitioner. That is the way it was and will be that way and not some other way. So it's like, it's this, it's, it's war as this almost like deity, like this, this godlike figure that was, that was, you can just imagine I mean, you can't imagine, but like some kind of war spirit just waiting, waiting for humanity to evolve so that it could that it could become it's awaiting its ultimate practitioner. Mm. And then this is actually where I thought of that the very beginning quotes and the like the like the preface quotes where they talked about how it was like the Yuma Sun, like the, it was like a newspaper that said that a reexamination of a 300,000 year old fossil skull showed evidence of having been scalped. And that was a real, you know, that's like a real historical thing. So just showing that war was waiting for man from the very beginning because there there are a lot of times where they're out at night and it seems like the judge is like communicating with the stars and stuff yeah there's a lot of great imagery there but i mean last last part of the novel and i think it probably the most notorious part of the novel is the violence that is yeah that cormac mccarthy you know puts on to us makes this experience do you yeah. think that it is good you think that the violence is necessary or like, I, what do you I think it's i think it's completely necessary also I, so i don't know if this is quite violent but it's related to like just as this is i think i mentioned this to you when i first mentioned i was like there's a part in blood meridian that's almost like comical but it's actually insane where the judge fucking buys the puppies and just straight chucks them into the river that was insane that was like insane but it's like related so it's not quite violence but it is kind of related to violence like mm. it just evil and the book is full of evil and yeah what's up i would say i so i'm not squeamish towards violence like i'm fine with it is if it's good like if it has a purpose and i think like 90 percent of the novel it does have purpose but then like i think like with the puppy scene and just like some of the action scenes it felt like Connor mccarthy didn't trust the audience to pay attention so like he like just threw in like acts of violence just to like further like you know beat a dead horse no pun intended um, there's <laughs> yeah. a lot of beating beatings of horses in this as well there there are definitely moments from just like where it's like I, I understand like it's supposed to like where like if I say like oh I was indifferent towards the violence someone would go oh that's the point because the, the characters are indifferent I'm like I shouldn't be like wondering when I'm going to watch Netflix like while I'm reading like a, a scene of like villagers getting slaughtered you know like I feel yeah. like that's not the point and I, I do feel like there are times where Cormac just like the content itself isn't isn't too bad for me but like just like the excessiveness of it or I was kind of like okay like are these characters like divine themselves like can they just survive everything and like again with the, like if a kid reacted to this in any sort of meaningful way I would probably have a different perspective but like again that's he true. disappears for a while <laughs> that's true and again like I don't want to like a bash in the violence because like for the most part I I thought it was good and meaningful but like there were just times where I just I felt like Carmack was like just like wasn't sure if he was gonna be able to keep people's attention so I just kind of threw something in there and I feel like the, the that like the judge's philosophy and stuff like their conversations and like some of the imagery of like the judge walking with the idiot in like this deserted plane like some of that is like more disturbing to me than just like another scene where I'm like this only serves to just just for the for the characters to just to be violent you know so I yeah I agree with you and also kind of because I'm I'm of the camp where it's like I think the point is also too desensitized of it the point is almost and maybe this is a cop out but the point is like you said you're thinking about something else while a village is getting slaughtered that's mm. how that's how normal it is that's how just re- and you know the kid nobody has any reactions to violence at all they see the most horrific shit and they keep and they just keep on walking by and it gets to the point where the read as a reader like like I was kind of saying it's I almost like stopped. 
when I was think, taking notes for this book, I just like stopped taking notes of violence because at first I'm like, dude, that's crazy. That's crazy. And it gets so repetitive that it's like, it's not even like, it's like, why even, you know, put that down? It's just literally all throughout the book. And I mean, this is actually where I was getting Iliad vibes because the Iliad is just books on books on books of nothing, but people just getting like naming different people that just get killed in some horrific way, death after death after death. And I mean, I even think if anything, I mean, Blood Meridian serves the function of making you desensitized to it, which everybody is so mm. that when you do read, it's like, oh, another slaughter. OK, yeah, like you, you, <laughs> that, like this is regular. And so, I mean, but I, I, I do hear you where it's it is kind of like and, you know, we, we can wonder whether I'm I'm giving whether I'm being too charitable to Cormac McCarthy. You're and, a fanboy. No, OK, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but it's 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 a thing. It's because. Yeah, there, there's the question of like whether he's just doing this to keep audience or if, and I'm just over interpreting by thinking it makes it, but with the desensitization, but it's also the point is to it's it is the judge's philosophy written large, like in actual action. Violence is everywhere. Uh, because he even like the very end. Well, okay, so I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but the end where it's like the judge is the judge is dancing at the thing. He's a great favorite, the judge. The judge is dancing. He says he is everywhere. He says he does not sleep. He says he does not die. He says yeah. he is everywhere. He is everywhere. Like if we consider the judge is like a embodiment of like violence and death, then it is all I mean, that's like to me, Blood Meridian would not be Blood Meridian unless the violence it's almost like the 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 violence to me almost needs to be excessive for it to serve its function that's like the whole point not to mention of course this is all like you know more or less historically accurate these are all things that happen but it gets i mean the the fact that like you said you're thinking of watching netflix during a slaughter almost almost is the point like okay but then again am i is or is it just this is a matter of preference i guess yeah yeah exactly um i will say though that the, the cat so i was debating on reading the section out but i don't think if i read it it would do it any justice um the first the first battle the kid's a part of when he's in captain white's crew and yeah. like the oh my god moment yeah and, that was insane. like the build up and like i don't think any story has ever perfectly captured like like the insanity and the rush of battle quite like that for me yeah, that's that's the iliad too it's the thrill of war it's the glory of war although there's not much of that there's not really much thrill and glory but, but i just yes, think, I just on, think yeah. like there's like there's this chaos that's in this yeah in that section at the blood meridian that just it, it just captures like like this like the rush of like someone who's like in the middle of a battle i think like like i, I remember reading that section i'm like i'm in on this book now like that was can like I, the can i read a, can i read a part of it yeah you can read a part of it okay a legion of horribles hundreds in numbers half naked or clad in costumes like costumes by the way attic or biblical Mm. wardrobed out of a fever dream coats of slain dragoons frogged and braided cavalry jackets one in a stovepipe hat one with an umbrella and one in white stockings and a blood-stained uh, wedding veil and some headgear of crane feathers and rawhide elements. And it's like th they said um, the horseman's face gaudy and grotesque with daubings like a company of mounted clowns, death hilarious, all howling in a barbarous tongue and riding down upon them like a horde from a hell more horrible yet than brimstone land of Christian reckoning. And they're like shrieking. And then it's like later, just real quick, I, this this is a must read. I'm so, and it's like, okay, running about on the ground with a peculiar bandy legged trot like creatures driven to alien forms of locomotion and stripping the clothes from the dead and seizing them up by the hair and passing their blades about the skulls snatching aloft the bloody wigs and hacking and chopping at the naked bodies ripping off limbs heads gutting the strange white torsos and holding up great handfuls of viscera genitals some of the savages so slathered up with gore they might have rolled in it like dogs and some who fell upon the dying and sodomized them with loud cries to their fellows it's like that is insane I'm glad you read it so well because i was afraid of, i'd read it and stutter over myself and ruin the scene but you did a good job with it yeah, that so that you're right. That is the part where I'm. I, I was reading that with jaw dropped. I'm mm. like, this is insane. But like that, it's like. So you said it's like it captures like the spirit of violence, and I think that's very true. There is like an otherworldly quality to it, and almost, it's like they're they're wearing a stovepipe. It's it's absurd almost. He's got a stovepipe yeah. hat and a wedding dress, and they're like wearing ears and shit. That's a whole another thing. Like the iconography, like the tokenization of death everyone's wearing fucking strings of ears strings of teeth everyone's like just holding scalps and all types of shit but it's like that is the spirit of violence 
right there writ large but i just want to say that because then later the perfect parallel to that right is the american charge you know what i'm talking about with the american charge of the apaches where it's like they're like you said they're swinging infants by the heel yeah he's smashing their fucking the, the heads out. on the stones he's and... got he's got a fucking basket of heads like a, some strange some strange vendor it's the same because mm-hmm. it's like you see that and it's like whoa the apaches are like on some savage shit and you see the americans the Apaches are just responding to what the Americans came and did in the first place. Yeah, And then they're absolutely. straight slaughtering some innocent village. Like the, the difference is these people are, when the Apaches come and attack the Americans, the Americans are guilty of, you know, having come in their land and invaded them. The difference here is the Americans are straight up slaughtering like innocent, innocent villages. Sometimes they're not even Mexican or not. Sometimes they're not even Indian. They're slaughtering Mexicans and pretending like they're so they can get money for Indian scalps. Like it's, it's they are the savages no they're, like they're basically declaring war against this mexican government because they're fighting just normal mexican soldiers yeah just run, do, going about their day um and it's like not even a money thing anymore it's just, it's just like a need for savagery Dude, that's and, it's, the thing, and it's probably being they, fueled for fueled by the judge and his supernatural yeah, powers yeah it probably yes you're right but it's like they get they do that slaughter they get all the money and by the way everyone's praising them they're 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 they're, they're like tree they fall on they're falling on as heroes everyone's trying to touch their feet like literally their boots religious imagery right there they get the money they blow it in two weeks just drinking literally that's what they do and then they run out of money and they need to go slaughter more uh native americans so they can fuel their drinking habit and 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 all centers around the judge basically yeah he like and as as like his his whole philosophy is just like is just like that war is the most like inherent thing in yep. this world and it almost is like it's like a fountain of youth for him that keeps him young i would yeah speculate oh interesting yeah i like that because it's he does have that immoral because qual- the when he's when the kid sees him later he, he had not changed at all he showed yeah. no signs of change it's almost like he th- thirsts like like lives off of blood yeah off of violence like that's where he gets his energy and also like war is. with that with that last scene where he's talking about like what what yesterday means like all those people that you knew died yep. and they have no impact in your life anymore like what was their purpose you were a horrific murderer 20 years ago but now you're here so like was there really ever any consequence to that like what yeah. like, like the ideas of like what like like does your past matter if you can just can if the kid can just or the man can just go back to living a normal life after yep. you know doing what he did what do you what do you think um you're supposed to, what do you think is like the point of blood Meridian? like what do you get from this novel from reading it it's oh, like a good a, like final question i mean honestly i feel like my main takeaway is that violence truly is violence and war it really is kind of fundamental to human nature like you don't have humans without having war and violence and he talks about that if there's two if you can imagine two people on two people alone together they will find they will find a game to play in which their stakes are their lives things like that and then like the little quote where it's like three hundred thousand years ago there's evidence of people getting scalped it's like you know i like to be optimistic and it's like and obviously not everybody is like this but i like to be optimistic and it's like we that's something we can maybe outgrow but i almost feel like the message of this book is that he that that death and violence is everywhere and the in the end ju- the judge is dancing he is a great favorite the judge he says he never sleeps he is everywhere he says he will mm. not die and if the judge is war that is all true he's everywhere war does not sleep he is a great favorite the judge that's like the thrill of war like we talk about the iliad that's over three thousand years ago right yeah. or almost three thousand years ago and it's like the very what what is it it doesn't seem like a coincidence to me that one of the greatest and first texts of all of literature is is a, is a novel about war or a poem about war. That's and, you know, that's a great point, actually. And, and it comes and goes. It comes in cycles, but it's all it's never it never leaves. War, the judge never sleeps. He is everywhere. He never or even dies. like if you go back to like cave paintings, like a lot of cave paintings that depict war. Yes, exactly. Battle. Exactly. Oh, so, no, it's. Yeah, no, it's, that's actually something I didn't I hadn't considered yet. Yeah, like like the like one, like the first great epics of literature period is a war, yeah. is a war epic, the Iliad, yeah. and it's as it's as relevant today as it ever was. Yeah, and exactly. it will always be relevant. When God made man, the devil was at his elbow. Do you think the Do you think blood and writing will always remain relevant? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I like again, the optimistic part of me is like that's that might be is violence something we can outgrow. But I, I do, I do want like perhaps a more realistic take is that it will always be relevant in the same sense that the Iliad is always relevant because there will mm. always be there will there will always be war. Like it's hard to imagine the human species without some sort of like physical forms of without some kind of conflict right i would agree yeah it's difficult to imagine especially like because like the like like the the eradication of, of the plains indians in american history is like it's such yep. like a brutal example of like what happens when um man is unchecked and when they can basically just yeah. do whatever they want and yeah. you get this mass slaughter it's yep. Because like you exactly. know, like Clanton's gang is completely ungoverned. Upon They're which, only governed that's... by the other tribes that are also trying yeah. to kill them. Yeah, <laughs> and that's what that's what the United States is built off of is Blood Meridian. It's yeah. stuff happening in Blood Meridian. That is what we. That is the land we are on, and that is what our entire this empire has been built from is mm. is violence and slaughter. Like that's I think that's the point of Blood Meridian. Yeah, the, uh, ignoring ignoring like borderlines and just like no we want this land yeah um yeah so is there anything else you want to talk about no except i just love i I like this i like this book a lot and the set the second reread i think or the second read was helpful because i had kind of gotten past all that initial stuff of like i know what i'm getting into Mm -hmm. so i felt like i was able to extract more from it and enjoy it more so i think that may have a part to do with why i like it more maybe than you but no i I mean i like i really like this is like a solid like between four and four and a half stars for me okay that's fair that's that's fair it's not quite five stars because again i like i just despise the trope of like of like the like the bland protagonist camera yeah her i mean and like maybe if i reread it i'll pick up on some more more nuances that you did um that was basically it like and like you said it's like and i will say where where the real stuff of blood meridian is happening He's he's nowhere to be found. He drops mm-hmm. off the map. So I, I agree with you there. That is a because you could imagine if the the kid had the depth of the judge, what a better story it could have been. Yeah. What a richer story it could have been. Well, thank you, Big Nate from Big yeah. Facebook Reviews for joining me. <laughs> How if this video does well, maybe we'll do more Cormac McCarthy in the future. Yeah. He's a he's a hot topic issue right now. He is. Yep. And I kinda, um, I'm excited. Are, are, do you plan on reading The Passenger? How about that? I could read the passenger. Yeah, we can. We can. I'm talk kind about of. It. I'm kind of scared because it's like I just read his masterpiece. Do I want to read? Like, I, I'm worried about the passenger. We'll see. I'm. I'm just like. I think it's either going to be really good because it's like this has been his work. He's been working on for the last twenty years, or it's just mm-hmm. like, and sends it off. Like you know. No, no one in the comments will make it this far into the video, but um, <laughs> let us know. Do you want Cormac McCarthy or um, Lonesome Dove? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that'll be the test to see if people made it made it this far yeah you're right exactly okay well thank you for having me on matt it's been a pleasure and you i'll plug um all of your stuff in the Mm, in in the in the bio below and yeah and we also do we also do i'm also a special guest on your podcast yeah we did we did the uh yeah of the iliad which has come up frequently so yeah um which will come i'm I'm editing that by the way it's almost it's it's getting there okay yeah that would be a great companion piece Another or, another epic discussion to fit an yeah. epic book. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, thank you, everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.